when you're talking to folks in the agricultural sector, farmers talking about ways that their land is going to remain in agriculture in one way or another, that you know the land is going to be at the end of the life cycle of the project, better, healthier, richer right. than like when we started. Like that's a great customer centric approach. Hey, welcome back, Solar Warriors. If you're new here, I want to just really appreciate that you are taking time out of your busy day to give us the one non-renewable resource you've got, of course, your time. And your attention is super important. So you're going to want to pay special attention because today's guest has lots to share with us. Today's entrepreneur has a varied background from banking to renewable energy and brings a lot of his experience both on and off the field, as we say, to the way that he and his co-CEO are building Encore Renewables. Blake Sturkey is someone that uh, if you haven't heard or met yet, you're going to really enjoy. I promise the conversation gets deep and vulnerable and uh, we get into all kinds of things like, uh, like culture setting and vulnerability and allowing your team to grow. We talk about structuring the capital stack for a project development company, what it looks like to grow beyond the roots of the company and really develop and mature into a second or third phase of an entity. All that and more is awaiting you in today's episode, so please do stick around. And if this is the kind of thing that is your jam, you really love these kinds of conversations, but you haven't yet subscribed to Suncast, what are you waiting for? We've got more than 600 episodes just like this, clean energy founders on the front lines of the energy transition. And I promise that you will get a lot out of all of the episodes. They're built to be evergreen and to provide you with insight into how to build your own personal career, as well as the companies that you are building or serving. For now, let's get ready to tune up your skills, Solo Warrior, as we tune into another powerful conversation here on Suncast. Well, as you uh, heard in the intro, I'm super excited about the chance to interview today's guest. If you are a longtime listener, you no doubt have uh, heard the interview I did with Chad Farrell, the founder and, uh, and CEO, former CEO of, uh, of Encore Renewables out of Burlington, Vermont. Um, they've been able to uh, grow in, in numerous ways and attract talented people, among them my friends Lauren Glick, Glickman and uh, Chris Clement. And so I've been watching as this company grows. And when they made a decision to uh, elevate Blake into a co-CEO role alongside Chad, it piqued my interest to say the least. And I'm grateful to have Chad's co-CEO, Blake Sturkey, on the show today to dig into not the past, but the future and how to build a legacy as a project development company. Blake, thanks for joining us today. Yeah, it's great to be here, Nico. Thanks, uh, thanks so much for having me. It's my pleasure, man. Uh, and thanks to Lauren for helping make this happen. Um, she, as she so often does, Lauren has placed, uh, I don't know, a dozen or two dozen people on the Suncast podcast uh, before going in-house for you guys at Encore. You're incredibly fortunate to have someone like her on staff, that's for sure. That I totally agree with. <laughs> yeah, she, she has been an awesome addition to the team. She's been with us, I think, full-time Two years, um, but she had uh, really worked really closely um, with us for uh, two or three years prior to that, really leading our marketing effort externally. She now she now runs both marketing and policy. Um, she's doing an aw she's awesome. She was a huge addition to the team. That's apropos because I like to start out with an inspiring quote, and the one that is on my desktop today as we get kicked off, he off, off here, listeners will know that I have uh, rotating backgrounds that are inspiring quotes that I, I like to read. It says, one machine can do the work of 50 ordinary men or people. No machine can do the work of one extraordinary person. That's Albert Hubbard. I love that quote because being extraordinary is not, it doesn't happen by chance. And I think Lauren is one of those people who can often, it seems, do the work of 50 people, <laughs> right? And it's emblematic of the startup culture as well, that you have a team full of those kinds of folks. Do you have a similar inspiring quote or are you, are you like me, a quote hoarder? <laughs> one, one of the quotes uh, that, that uh, I think about um, <clears throat> regularly, in fact, um, I sort of have a recurring reminder as it relates to this quote. It's um, a quote from Viktor Frankl. Mm -hmm. And um, the quote it talks about the period of time. There's a period of time between stimulus and response. And, mm -hmm. and that period is one 
you know, that allows for reflection. And, and, and that reflection then, you know, can help to shape um, the path upon which we, we make decisions and the timeline upon which those decisions perhaps are made. I think it's a super powerful quote. It's been a super powerful f- quote for me. Um, and, it, and it sort of ties to, uh, into the concept of, of mindfulness and um, you know, emotional intelligence. Um, those are things that are, su- are really important to me. Um, from an uh, organizational perspective, we, we think a lot about EQ. Um, and, and I could go into further like, you know, that or, you know, sort of, you know, this quote, but, um, I really like it. Really like it. I, I want to read the quote. Cause I, um, I just looked it up while, while you were chatting and I very specifically, so this quote has been one of my favorites for many yeah. years. And man's search for meaning is one of my top recommended books to folks. I just sat down with my son who's 12, um, this earlier this like over the weekend and i remember earlier in his life six seven three four five years old um i would get really mad when he would do stuff and i was just it was my own immaturity i would just i would reflect outwardly the insecurity i felt about who i saw him being and uh and i would you know yell at him and stuff like that i come from a pretty harsh background in my my, my childhood um, and I feel like this was one of those moments where I had an opportunity. He screamed at his brother and I went in and I sat down and I didn't say a word. I just sat down on the floor where he was sitting, stewing it, slammed the door. And I just waited until he said something. And in the dialogue I had with him after that moment uh, of earning the opportunity to speak to him, uh, I said, you know, Victor Frankel's got this quote. <laughs> and, I want you to, and I want you to reflect on it because what just happened, you know, I didn't say like, what just happened with your brother, blah, blah, right? I just said, I want you to reflect on this quote. And I shared this quote and I got up and left. Um, and the quote I'll read to everyone for the benefit of it, that, that we already, already know. It says, between the stimulus and response, there's a space. And in that space lies our freedom and power to choose our responses. And in our response lies our growth and our freedom. Man, that's super powerful. Uh, yeah. The way I the way I usually express that um, inappropriately quoting it, I'll usually say, you know, um, Viktor Frankl often says that man's greatest power is the moment between stimulus and response. That we alone possess the ability to make a decision about what happens next. I would share that um, I have four older children, older meaning sort of college or finishing high school, and then I have a three-year-old. And wow. it was somewhere between, um, you know, my 17 year old, uh, and, and my three year old that I became aware of this, uh, thought mindset, um, and, and matured enough, um, to be able to be in a position to in fact, utilize it. And the difference in terms of how I'm able to navigate instances with a three-year-old now yeah. versus before um, is, is really tremendous. But, but this applies, like, I think it is so applicable to how you, 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 you run a company, how you mm. work. It doesn't, it doesn't matter what the it's context true. is. It applies. It just applies across the board. Yeah. It, it's so true. Uh, I can think of numerous instances where, uh, you know, uh, there's another quote, uh, and I don't know who this is attributable to, but it's character is who you are when no one's looking. <laughs> yeah. And if you think yeah. about, um, <laughs> a lot of folks say character is who you are when people are looking. And oftentimes that character in the boardroom, in the, in the corporate meeting, um, and, in a very masculine, uh, or to, to, to use a gender norm, like masculine, like in a very masculine way is aggressive in the business environment, right? It's like something didn't happen and you, Someone flies off the handle and yells about it instead of instead of being able to have the maturity to to suppress that impulse. You know, on on that a, a, a lesson that I've learned over time is, uh, and and this is I think partly a function of sort of my uh, <clears throat> my background uh, professionally. 
coming predominantly, you know, through finance and investment banking, and that being a world where um, people valued quick decisions. Oh yeah. Um, they valued who was the smartest, you know, in in the room, who had the best ideas in the room. They and 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 it was an aggressive environment, and 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 that carries, you know, I probably as to what you're saying across most organizations. I think most businesses. That's how most companies are run, and um, you know what what I. And this comes back to that that concept of of reflection. What, what I realized is that, um, you know, it's so often the case that the immediate um, decision response idea is not is not the best one, and that in fact, you know, as as a leader, as a team member, as a colleague, um, there's nothing wrong with saying, um, I, you know, that's actually a really interesting question. That's that's it's. It's uh, it's one that I think we'd get to a better answer on if we reflected on it. Let me take a little bit of time. Now that doesn't always work. There are instances where you need to make a decision. Um, you can't do that all the time, but um, you you can do in many instances. And sort of if if you don't reflect, you don't even give yourself the opportunity to think that right. You just immediately respond. And so it's sort of like trained be- trying to get to like a trained behavior of. Where, where, where you give yourself that opportunity, and I don't do a particularly good job of it. Like, I, cause, because, I mean, from time to time I do, but then the reason I have it as a re- recurring reminder is that it it's not it's not easy. It's not easy for me, uh, in any case. Well, we may uh, we may get into at some point how uh, how you incorporate making it easy uh, or easier. Um, or at least present and intentional. Um, for now, I'd like to sort of back out to a bit of a 30,000 foot level and think think at the macro about what it is that we're trying to accomplish in the world by creating these kinds of companies. H- how do you describe the problem that yours or companies like your uh, company Encore is designed to solve? So what, what we are looking at is an existential uh, climate challenge. Uh, we 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 need a whole host of things to address that challenge. One of one of which is uh, huge amounts of additional clean energy coming onto the grid, um, and we need to utilize as many resources available to us, whether that be um, technological or um, or or from a siting perspective. Um, in order to in order to meet that meet that need. So, for those who are unfamiliar, would you take a moment then and introduce us to Encore and why Encore is helping solve that problem that you've just enunciated? So, Encore is a vertically integrated clean energy IPP. Uh, we are focused on the development, construction, long term ownership. Uh, and uh, management of distributed generation, solar, and storage assets. I think that two things that are unique about why we're particularly well suited to address this uh, address this question is, in order to meet that challenge, uh, we need to be able to cite projects not only in the easiest places to cite them but also in the hardest places to cite them. We started as a brownfields and landfill uh, redevelopment company. And we happen to believe really strongly that um, those are, while more challenging, uh, the best places to develop, to develop uh, clean energy projects. It's you know sort of this concept of brownfields to bright fields. And we can talk about that a little bit further. Did, did you guys be of coin that term? Because it's one that has now become proliferated, right? Yeah. Um, I'm going to give credit to Lauren on that front. I can't definitively say if she coined it or not, but it feels to me like uh, something that she, she, she very well may have. It's being used, uh, and the term bright fields is being used a whole lot more today, mm-hmm. right? And obviously there's bright field renewals. There's a lot of, like, it's not, that idea I think is, is interesting. And then Brownfields to Brightfields, we talked about it in Chad's episode, right? So as, as far back, what was that, 2018, 2019, when we interviewed mm-hmm. Chad? 
So I think that what's cool about having this, like that, those kinds of interviews is they, they do stand as like a prior art, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. If somebody tries to say, no, 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 we were saying this in 2020. It's like, well, Chad was on record. So a couple of unique elements you were pointing out. One is the, the need and, and in fact, the core competence of your company to expand beyond just the postage stamp, clean, flat sites uh, that everyone has tried to over-optimize development companies around finding and, and, and developing. And in addition to that, uh, we, we started the company as an impact-focused company uh, that continues to be um, really core to who we are, what we do, um, and, uh, you know, and how we're not only building the company, but also how we uh, interface and impact communities and stakeholders that we work with. So why is that important in terms of its relevance to the broader question um, of you know, what the objective is? What is the, what is the macro question issue that we and others are working on? Uh, and then we can come back to why that we think this is the right way to build a company and run a company internally. But externally, um, an orientation around partnerships with communities, projects that uh, make positive impacts as it relates to high quality jobs or contributions to important centers of uh, community service uh, mm -hmm. and impact within the communities that we operate in matters because we, 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 we're seeing as an industry a tremendous amount of pushback. And there's pushback for a lot of different reasons, misinformation, nimbyism. In order to scale to the degree we think that we need to as an industry, some form of a partnership orientation, a, a, an approach whereby um, all stakeholders feel as if they're benefiting as opposed to having something imposed on them, we think is, we think is, is, is really important. One of the things that I think that I'd like to dig a little deeper on now, because you mentioned it, you mentioned the term IPP. That's not something that would have uh, been on Chad's lips in the conversation that we had several years ago. And it's one of the mm -hmm. most interesting for me evolutions of Encore. There is a natural evolution right now in the development space. Project development typically is the domain of folks that understand uh, how to uh, we'll, we'll say like tie up land and get interconnection and uh, add value to an otherwise sort of plain vanilla parcel of property and then sell it to, as a project, sell it to someone who wants to then sort of be the, the bill collector on the electrons that are being generated. But we're seeing more and more folks moving from project development into the independent power producers, IPP, that you just mentioned, and that effectively is asset owner. Can you talk about the evolution, um, sort of when did that decision take place inside of Encore? So uh, as, as, as you mentioned, um, you know, just, uh, just a few years ago, we were you know, a traditional self-originating developer of DG projects that we would then sell at NTP. Yep. Um, How do probably, you define DG? Uh, sorry, um, yeah, so, so distributed generation, the way we define it is you know, there are lots of ways um, to define it. We just sort of think about, um, you know, projects that are anywhere between sort of two, one to two megawatts DC to, to you know, up to 20 perhaps. Yes, yeah. that's exactly the definition that Next Era and FPL give it, by the way. So that's where I always stick it. It's like, oh yeah, yeah. they, they refer to anything under 20 megawatts as distributed generation. And it's yeah. that one to 20 band. Um, cool, I just want to distinguish that. I'm sorry to interrupt, but- No worries. I want to make sure like IPP and DG, they're terms that we understand, but not every listener does. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. That ma yeah. That makes sense. Uh, Sweet. So what led okay. us down this path um, was really two, two things. And they were core to um, our underlying philosophy around how to build a company. So first, um, we have been and continue to be um, really focused on a strategic partner slash trusted advisor type of model with um, with our counterparties, with our stakeholders. So um, a university or, um, you know, a large, large industrial uh, corporate with a large, you know, a, a large, uh, large load. I can talk a little bit more about like what that means. But 
in order to be a long-term partner, you need to be involved with the asset uh -huh. for a long period of time. So what we found was challenging was having conversations whereby um, you know, we would be um, having discussions around what um, uh, Middlebury College, for example, what their, what their energy plan was, what, uh, how climate fit into that over the next 10 to 20 to 30 years, you know, what set of alternatives exist, existed in order to execute um, against that plan, right? And so that's sort of like how, how we think about an advisory role. And then that would lead into you know, projects. It would be, you know, projects that would uh, ultimately drive revenue and drive cash flow for us, but it built on this, on this partner foundation. Yeah. Um, not uh, unsurprisingly, Middlebury and others, they said, well, okay, you know, when the project projects are done in two years, three years, four years, who's, who's going to own those projects? Who are we going to be working with for the next 20 to 30 years? Mm -hmm. And, you know, our answer would be, um, you know, one of our, you know, financing partners, right. a group that, you know, the, a group that we've worked closely with. Um, that's not as good of an answer as, well, with us, we're going to like, we're your partner for the next 35, 35 years. I mean, this is one of the reasons why Sun Edison had such an um, unbelievably um, advantageous proposition in the marketplace at the time that they did, because everybody else was financing it through third parties and, and mm -hmm. Sun Ed and a few others, Sun Power name, and for solar, like these bigger companies had the ability to say, well, it's us long term. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's yeah. interesting. I've never heard anybody enunciate it that way, Blake. Uh, mm -hmm. Having, no, having bid on projects like, I mean, I went to Middlebury, so having bid on projects How like this and yeah. Um, I, I, well, I, I went to Mid Middlebury Institute, which is now uh, was Monterey Institute. Anyways, yeah, I'm very uh, like, I have this uh, sort of affinity for in connection with Middlebury, Middlebury. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, and the project that you guys did, but I can understand um, having been in the room, the re the way that that conversation sounds. I really appreciate that you enunciated it because I don't think that like we having been in the project development uh, space and having been in the room with those folks can intuit that that is a, that it is an inevitability. But I feel like a lot of folks, that's that's not necessarily true in the real estate industry, right? Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of folks coming into the space who are um, used to development in different verticals might not intuit that the, uh, that the university cares who owns the asset. All they're buying is electrons. For them, it's just transfer buying, right? You're not buying from the utility anymore, some portion of your electrons. It's no different um, than, than picking up eggs from a different grocery store, right? Why should you care who the farmer is? But turns out a lot of folks do. Yeah. You know, and, and uh, the, the, reason, the reason why, you know, we, we've chosen to take that approach in terms of effectively a go-to-market strategy is we think it's a better business model because what 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 doing that work up front to be an, an an advisor to a counterparty does is it puts you in a position where you're no longer competing on price but rather you're competing on ideas it also it also gets you to a place where you're mapping out with that partner like how do, where do we go from here together you're you're in the room helping to guide and shape, add, add value and thoughts as the subject matter, ec matter expert, which has the benefit for us of giving us some visibility into um, you know, what our pipeline might look like. And you need, to, you need to do that in order to be able to build, uh, build a company. And, and that is, and, and I mention, I say company, so, and what I really mean there is like, a durable, long lasting, mm -hmm. long live company. Because, um, so we, you know, from the time Chad started Encore, uh, we were, you know, have been super focused on impact and we can talk about what, like how we think about that. We became, mm -hmm. you know, we, we uh, sort of cemented that if you will, or, um, uh, you know, made it like, uh, went through a third party, verification process when we became a B Corp in 2016. 
the best definition in my mind of a really successful impact company is not one that makes a huge impact in a couple of years. It's actually one that um, makes a long, you know, a long live durable impact over um, an extended period of time. And one of the challenges with the develop sell business model is um, that it's, it's, it's super variable, super variable. We all know that. Um, and so it's not that aligned, well aligned with that mission objective. Whereas on the other hand, we felt like if we can transition, like how do we transition to becoming an IPP? If we can, we can meet this strategic partner, you know, objective. Um, and that's going to have a lot of benefits. And we can get to a place where we have recurring, like visible, like visibility into almost annuity like cash flows that allow you to then like think about organizational design and and growth really differently um, in a powerful way. So, um, you know, like getting to this point, it's been a number of years to get to this point. We can talk about how, how do we do that? And, but wow, it's super like, um, you can probably hear in my voice, it's super exciting in terms of where we are now and like where we go from here. Yeah. And it fundamentally impacted the decisions for leadership that that we, you know, we'll go into a lot more detail about how the company structure. One of the things that you said just now reminded me of a book by Pat Lencioni that I want to recommend to folks to read and, and to you if you haven't, um, but you guys embody this. And when I first heard it, I was like, get real. Like, this is the name of the book. It's called Getting Naked. Have you heard this book? I, I, I haven't. I've heard of the author. Right? It makes you laugh. Heard. Like, it makes, know, it, it, makes you, it, it gives everyone that kind of uncomfortable feel. Um, yeah, I like it. But I'll link to it in the show notes called Getting Naked by Patrick Lencioni. And um, it is a fantastic book about, about how, I mean, the, the subtitle, it's a business fable about shedding three fears that sabotage client loyalty. And when you get in the position of, um, you, when you said we put, get, we put ourselves in a position to compete on ideas rather than price, that is magic. That's magic. And like all magic, there's a, there's an art to it. And, uh, so I, I, one of the things that Patrick and Lanzani unpacks in the book is, is the art of, um, of learning how to do that. And, uh, so I wanted to point folks to that cause I, I don't want to actually believe that that might have been one of the most important statements in the entire interview and we're barely into it. So, um, those little nuggets of wisdom, man, are why I do this. So if you, there's an, an there's an extension of that, which is, if you're competing on ideas as opposed to price, you need to you need you need to design your team differently. So um, the skills and and um, uh, you know the creative creativity and the experience and the um, you know level of EQ that team members have uh, in order to in order to compete effectively with this that model. Are so different than if you're competing on price. If it, 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 it's just really different, and then so that then filters into how we think about um, team development and what's important. What's important? I think you need a certain type of team member to be effective in that type of way. We also think it's way better, by the way, um, uh, around like retention and level of job contentedness. Like, do you want to, at the end of the day, win a project because, um, like, you had really interesting insights and new approaches, and and you got to that place through a collaborative effort internally? Because it's never the case that, like, we have a single, you know, let's just say it's in the business development side, a single team member, you know, coming up with, um, you know, some really innovative approach by themselves rather yeah. it's a discussion around okay here this is it's all we try to start with what is the counterparty's objectives what what are they focused on what are they trying to get away and of course there's a landscape around what's the what is the competitive landscape look like um but but then a discussion internally about like well how could we solve that within the constraints of the world that we and by world you know, like legal structures that, you know, that we need to work with yeah. or, you know, project financing requirements, like what is doable 
And so it's never one individual. But so if you if you then end up going back as an organization and winning on the basis of something that was really interesting, not just price, um, and you got there with your team members, like it's it's super rewarding. And I think mm-hmm. you know what I mean. Like it's it's I do. it's uh, it's great. And so people when they're con- like when they're when they feel rewarded and challenged and content at work. And we spent a ton of time thinking about, well, how do we do that? Well, that's the environment where people, people stay and they want to come. And then, then you get around like all the issues around retention and hiring and training costs. And right. We all know that, you know, turnover is super expensive and we've had, uh, you know, virtually none over the last like 15 years. I love it. Lauren, you can just clip that last three minutes and put it on the website. (laughs) (laughs) That's Um, for you. That's for you. Yeah, that was for you. Uh, But it was genuine, actually. (laughs) I I love that. It was unprompted as well, which is better. I'm very curious to hear your answer, just the way that you phrase it. So who do you sell to and what problems do you solve for them? So we sell to one of the complexities associated with our, our business is that you have to sell to multiple parties. So, um, yeah, we sell to uh, you know, users of power. Uh, like that's that's sort of you know reasonably obvious, right? And so you know specifically, we sell to universities, um, you know, large corporations, municipalities. Each of those have sort of different um, objectives. You know that as a, as when they're thinking about uh, energy procurement. Um, yeah. In any instance, we're always starting with, despite what I just said, you know, economics are like, you know, are way up front. They have, they have to be, um, like we're not selling based on climate impact. And in fact, I don't really care if, you know, the counterparty cares about, yeah. about climate because it doesn't, right. in my mind, it doesn't matter. Um, right. Because like, the economics of it makes sense. And, and ultimately we need everybody to get on board. To get right. to the right outcome, right? We need ever we need everyone on board, whether they're a believer or, or whatever, irrespective of what they what mm-hmm. they believe. So yep. the the other group then that we sell to is um, to mm-hmm. landowners. And yeah. why are we a good partner? You know, to you know, build a project, develop a project, build a project that's going to sit here for the next twenty five to to forty years. Yeah. And that's a different. <clears throat> you know, those are very different. Uh, customer bases, if you will. Yeah. And it requires different, uh, different teams, different skills. Yeah, totally. Uh, to do 100%. that. percent. So where I'm going is agrivoltaics. Mm, yeah. Uh, and, um, like specifically that becomes, you know, sort of with thinking about how to go to market with different types of customers and meet their objectives. Um, that's something that, um, you know, we've, we've been really focused on not only because we think it's important to do, um, but you know, when when you're talking to uh, ag- folks in the agricultural sector, farmers, um, you know, talking about ways that you know the their land is going to remain in agriculture in one way or another, that you know the land is going to be at the end of you know the life cycle of the project better than healthier, richer right. than like when we started. Yeah, like that's a great customer centric approach. We're did you grow up? Uh, I grew up outside of New York City in New Jersey. Gotcha. Not in the rural farm part, but in the city part, like r- the yeah, it's some like you know suburban, suburban New Jersey. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, how would you characterize the nature of the conversation with the with your family? Like, what was the conversation like around the dinner table when you were a child? My parents got divorced when I was fairly young, and. Uh, so we had like two dinner tables and I was, uh, um, and, and, and not surprisingly, the conversations were pretty different. So com- the, you know, in, in one household, um, you know, tended to be around, um, you know, how school going and sports yeah. and feelings and, and things like that. Pretty unstructured. Um, in the other household, um, uh, where my uh, my father's second wife 
uh, was the GC of a large commercial real estate company. My father was <clears throat> a partner at um, a big, what's now a big four accounting firm. Uh, mm -hmm. We tended to have more conversations around, uh, you know, sort of structure and path and ambition. And I remember something from uh, Melody, who I'm very close close with, my my stepmother. She talked about something like really silly about like serious people and like successful serious people. They, they walk fast and uh, like uh, they, they need, they need to get things done. And um, I've thought about that from time to time. And uh, I, I, I think that um, it's a euphemism for working, like working hard. And yeah. Uh, and uh, I think, you know, that was a big, big part of growing up was just like work ethic. I think it's interesting when someone says, oh, it's all pretty typical. But like, I find that those who are entrepreneurial minded consider like, yeah, I did like the typical thing. But I, an entrepreneur who have been an entrepreneur since 26, did not do entrepreneurial things as a child. I was born into entrepreneurial family. Like I didn't buy and sell wholesale gum or baseball cards or I didn't have a paper route. I had none of that. None of it, right? In fact, it didn't even occur to me that I could. And that's one of the things that's weird. I, mm -hmm. I often wonder, like, in a, in a self-flagellation, like, what's wrong with me? Like, why didn't I? I would have been a great, uh, I would have been a great little entrepreneur. I was like, <laughs> apart from the fact that I was smart enough, I was cute. I was like a young, a cute little kid. And I was the shortest in my class. It was like, I had everything going for me. What I tell my kid, who's, who's my 10-year-old, my um, who's like, way shorter than everybody else. And he's got beautiful long blonde hair. I'm like, dude, leverage your cuteness right now. You could sell rocks to your neighbors. Literally, you could just go harvest like acorns and sell them because adults will think it's cute and they'll give you money. And like, at least it teaches you how to get over your fear of knocking on a door and asking for money, right? Mm, um, yeah. So I, I don't know why I never did. I thought that was, a, I just, yeah, I no, listen. That's funny. That's funny. I hear, yeah. and, I, and I hear like, it, I hear in you like this very natural tendency to be an entrepreneur. Like there are, it's a really small percentage of students who in college decide I won't take the easy path of going to wait tables or going to like the, the student union to get a job or going to the bookstore or getting a job. Like I won't take a W-2 job. I'll start something because I think I can have more control over, over it or whatever the narrative is. But like, I think it's a very small percentage. So it's interesting for me to hear the sort of the narrative that you weave um, while, while thinking about it. In that vein, what career path did you not go down? but always thought you would. You know, I, I had, I was really passionate as a kid about animals and the environment um, more broadly. And, and I, and I thought I was going to do something, you know, up until I think eighth or ninth grade that, um, you know, in, in animal medicine. Uh, and, um, and I was certain of it until I took biology, I think. And I was like, oh, okay, this is, I'm actually going to do something different. And, um, and so it's been like, you know, I, I came back into, or I really entered, um, you know, the, um, you know, the climate environmental space uh, now uh, over, over 10 years ago prior to joining Encore. Um, and like, it's just been awesome to get to a place where in fact I'm doing something that I'm like really passionate about because there was that yeah. intervening period of time where I was doing things I was interested in, yeah. but not passionate about. Right. And, and even, and, and talented at, but not passionate about, um, leaning into the walk fast part of life. Um, <laughs> here's that. Moment. I haven't thought about that. I have not thought about that quote and in quite some time. It's funny. It's funny that That's I came good. to mind. She's yeah, she's classic. She's great. So, she's great. So I find that a lot of folks, like you mentioned, um, you know, starting a paper distribution out. I find a lot of folks will, even on LinkedIn, they'll gloss over like the early things they did in their career. They'll completely whole cloth eliminate jobs that sucked or, or work they did that didn't like progress their career, so to speak. Um, so I, I still nevertheless feel that they are stepping stones, building blocks. They like losing or being a part of a thing that loses and fails is often more instructive than being a part of a thing that wins. Um, I find the most depressed people are the ones who win early and they don't understand why. And, <laughs> right, they have no way to actually recreate it. And they're like 26 years old and they're millionaires and they, they're depressed as hell. 
and they have no idea why. What if any detours in your career, I'll let you take this anywhere you want, but what if any detours in your career have informed your current path? So the biggest detour I experienced by far um, was uh, in around uh, 2008, 2009. So I'd been um, in banking following uh, business school for you know 10 plus years at that point in time. Um, and um, I, I had some you know, really challenging personal issues at, at that time. Um, and those, those, those challenges, the primary one was related to mental health, um, you know, impacted every area as it often can, every area of, of my life. Um, and really sort of threw me off this track that I'd been on, you know, for, you know, for an extended period of time within investment banking and, and like the success track, it kind of derailed you. Yeah, totally. Is that what you mean? To yeah. yeah, totally. In fact, um, I mean, during that time, not only, so I was, we were in the, you know, 2008 um, crisis, you know, financial, financial crisis. crisis. Wow. And you're um, in banking. And I was in, in banking and I was dealing with these personal, personal issues Yeah, uh, and ended up losing, losing my job. And yeah. Um, I lost. By the way, I mean, you were yeah. a director at Deutsche Bank. You weren't just like in banking. You were on the ladder, right? Like you were in the accelerated. Like I would, I assume you were like one of those that's tapped and like you're on the growth path. Yeah, I was in in a position where um, you know for a number of years I'd had a lot of opportunity to grow um, and take on additional responsibilities, both <clears throat> in New York. Um, uh, we lived in Hong Kong for a period of time and I was responsible for, um, some of Morgan Stanley's activities in, in India, Hong Kong, Taiwan. Um, I worked across a couple of different, um, product areas. So corporate finance, mergers and acquisitions, um, capital markets, uh, and, 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 uh, and was doing, yeah, I was doing pretty, you know, pretty well, um, you know, from a career track perspective. Um, and so I was in this situation then where, and we can talk about those personal challenges, but just to answer specifically the question, um, I was in this place where, um, you know, what I had done my entire career, you know, finding a job in that sector, um, like was virtually impossible. And, um, and with at that oh, point, when you, and, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Go After ahead. getting let go from Deutsche Bank. After, after getting let go, um, you know, being in this you know, in this environment where banks were shedding people, um, yeah. you know, trying to figure out, you know, what, where to go from there. And um, it ended up being like that for lots of different reasons, that period of time um, and the challenges within it ended up being the greatest, um, you know, opportunity um, in terms of, you know, bending in a, in a different direction. And ultimately where I went then was I said, you know what, this provides me with an opportunity to look, look at elsewhere, to do something different. And then, and then, um, you know, ask the simple question, well, what do I, what do I want to do? Like, what, to, like, what's, what's interesting? What, what do I care about? Um, and, and then couple that with, you know, and where is their economic opportunity? Like, where is their growth? And, um, and oh, by the way, um, I want to do something entrepreneurial because one of the things that I learned, one of the great things about investment banking, and, and there are a number of really good things. There, there are lots of not so great things. But one of them is that a really um, early stage in your career, <clears throat> you get exposure to C-level executives, boards of directors of big and small companies, um, typically those small companies, depending on what firm you're working at, are you know, really high growth companies. Um, you're working with um, you know, private equity firms, venture funds, and you, so you get a ton of exposure. I was focused on um, technology, working with technology and, and communications companies back sort of around 2000. And um, had an opportunity to work with a lot of really successful entrepreneurs and and observe what they were doing and and it was clear to me that I wanted to at some point you know lead lead a company build a company work in some entrepreneurial capacity and 
you know, I put those different pieces together and said, okay, I'm going to move in an entrepreneurial direction within environmental services. Um, and, and I, uh, co-founded with two partners, <clears throat> a, an organics recycling company called Turning Earth, where I was for a handful of years before coming over to, uh, join Encore. Why then leave this thing that you founded to join Encore? Like what was the pull? The thesis underlying, uh, Turning Earth was that there was, um, the time, um, was opportune to create, um, a biogas business focused on pre and post consumer food waste uh, and other organics um, in densely populated areas, you know, within the U.S. We had seen elsewhere, um, you know, Europe in particular, you know, a lot of success with the business models. Uh, technologies worked, um, and you know, the business model worked, um, and it's a really terrific. It's a terrific business model. And uh, and it and it and it also is really compelling environmentally. You're taking waste. You're getting paid to take wet waste to create revenue streams and valuable products, biogas and compost in this particular area. Um, and um, you know you're you're also converting what is currently be treated being treated as a waste product. You're converting that into into value. And you know. It's, um, what we found is we created a strategic partnership with uh, Fortune 500, largest waste energy company in the world. Uh, we acquired uh, an, a great technology uh, for North America, licensed it uh, from a, a, a Danish company, raised early stage uh, capital um, in a Series A. Um, and we found that we were wrong with respect to timing. So, um, and the market was... <laughs> The market wasn't ready, um, uh, at least in the markets we focused on, it wasn't ready to see these types of plants built in densely populated areas. And this is circa 215, by the way, for folks that aren't, aren't looking at LinkedIn like I am. Yeah. So, so um, you know, uh, five plus years into a startup, um, you know, I wanted to do two things. Um, one, move, move into a company uh, whereby projects were getting done as opposed yeah. to simply worked on. So f really feel impact. And two, um, I had, I had just run out of like sort of entrepreneur startup runway, uh, right. Yeah. Just financially four kids. Um, and it was time for me to do something different. So solar became my, um, my focal focal point because like solar had figured it out at that point, right? It was getting project finance and it was starting to scale the economics work. And so I was networking, um, you know, chatting with people and connected with Chad Farrell. Um, Chad and I, um, where were, were you living at the time? Uh, at the time I was uh, living in the city, New York city. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And you and Chad? Yeah. Chad and I, um, Chad and I, um, had gone to college together, were friends in college, had, okay. uh, had not been in touch for <clears throat> maybe 20 something years up until the time I started, uh, turning earth. And, uh, we reconnected because, um, early in early days, at Encore, Chad was trying to figure out as we sort of, many of us do with early stage companies, mm -hmm. what is the business model? How do we make this work? And one yeah. of the things he was looking at was project management services. And we were talking yeah. about ways that we might be able to collaborate, Turning Earth with Encore. And so we got to, we reconnected personally, but we got to know one another really well professionally. And as, as we were chatting about, you know, what I was thinking about, um, Chad uh, said, Hey, um, I don't know what you'd think, but uh, like, we're super busy and um, I'm, I could use like, I'm, I'd be interested. I, I would benefit from a partner. You know, that it was that conversation that then shortly thereafter led to a trip up to Burlington. And I joined, I don't know, maybe two months later. Uh, and um, so that was 2000, summer of 2015. Yeah. Yeah. And, it's yeah. Been, and uh, you joined terrific. as chief financial officer. I did. I did. Why, right. why that role? Just because you're a banker? <laughs> um, yeah. I think... Um, you know, so we looked at 
So the company at that point was for, I was the fourth person. you've held basically person. every every role at, uh, in the executive suite of Encore at this point. <laughs> Except <laughs> for CTO, true. which I don't think is a, maybe you do have that role, but. That, that's true. Uh, like we joke around sometimes internally um, that, um, you know, not all, but an awful lot of the org chart used to be, used to be me. Um, and so one of the amazing things is as the organization grows, and the same is true for chat, like as an organization grows, is getting to a place where um, your requirements um, are such that you need to have people um, focused on specific areas and sort of it's like this mul like multiplication factor. So um, whereby, you know, you know, then there's a CFO, CIO, Chris, um, who's who's been like a phenomenal addition to the team, and and then and then you know a director of project finance like is born, and then a project finance associate is born, and we could see that across the organization. Um, and one of not only is that really rewarding in terms of it being just like clear evidence of wh what you're doing organizationally in terms of growth. Um, the, the creation of high quality jobs, which is one of the ways that we sort of think about like mm -hmm. what, you know, about measuring ourselves. Um, but then, um, there's this personal, I think, challenge associated with, um, professional development and leadership. And that is, um, and I think we all, or lots of us find this challenging and that is delegating, right? Oh, like, okay. so when you, when, you know, it, moving from a place where you do everything and, and everyone like experiences this to um, giving other people the opportunity, the autonomy to in fact run their, you know, their universe and, and manage their activities and, and then support them. And, and it, and it's different and it's hard yeah. initially but why is CFO? I think there were four of us and it just, it just seemed like, it just seemed like the right thing. We had, you know, head of development. We had Chad as I think the president or just the founder. That was his title, founder. I can't wait. Well, we need a finance guy, right? Like finance is pretty important. Um, and then that became like a catch all for, you know, lots of different stuff. So you've been with Encore for uh, almost nine years now, eight and a half years. If you're hanging out with a friend and they are kind of wanting to know the update on Encore, what do you think is the most exciting piece or, or part of that story? And one of the one of the great things about um, the journey at Encore has been um, that I think our core mission, as it relates to what we do organizationally, uh, that we talked about earlier, sort of getting clean energy projects onto the grid. Um, owning and operating them over you know long time horizon as a as a partner different institutions like that unto itself that unto itself is for me is super exciting. Um, however, I think um, the orientation of the company um, around impact and and using the company um, as a force for societal change. Um, is even is even more more exciting and like going back a number of years, I would have thought you know it's it's hard like how much of an impact as a, you know as it relates to that's like a big statement ambition yeah. can a small company have and I think two things one is what we've seen is that in fact you can have a much bigger impact than what you believe. And two, it's sort of the wrong way of thinking about it, because I think the right way of thinking about it is more along the lines of if everyone was doing, like if everyone as an individual or small company or a larger company was pushing in the right direction, yeah. you know, that we would collectively be like doing really, really positive, powerful things. And um, like some of this comes from like sort of living in a world where over time, increasingly you look and you say, you know, companies need to lead. Companies need to lead. Government is not like, I, but I do think there are instances where, you know, government's doing really great work. So I'm not sort of a, you know, 
like the IRA, for example, we, we could talk about like that was really good legislation. I'm super excited about that for because I think it's good policy um, in a number of different ways. But company, it's an imperative that if we want to get to um, a, a more just world, and 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 a world whereby we're we're really addressing this you know this climate crisis that companies have to you know have to work as leaders and the stuff that we're doing in that regard um, it really like it just really gets me super excited and some of those are external and and some of those you know some of those are internal. What differentiates a B Corp from? peers in, in you know, non B Corps and why would you choose to go on that path? Mm, yeah. So, um, like for us, the decision to become a B Corp was not so much about, um, changing our values. Um, rather it was, um, it was, um, it was, uh, it was to put ourselves through an external, audit process and so as to learn like knowing that we didn't know we didn't you know we there were lots of things that we didn't know about how to most effectively run you know an impact company and becoming a b corp is a lot of work the application process the biannual um audit but you know the amount of benefit that we gain so for example you know, you go through this application process and it says like, what is your, um, you know, what's your uh, parental policy? At the time, we didn't have a parental policy. And literally our policy was like, we're like, well, generous, like highly generous, you know, was sort of our, like, that's what our answer was. We had nothing written down. But so just being asked the question, especially as you're, in, when you're an earlier stage company and yeah. it forces upon you, you know, like policies and codifying what you believe. And that was incredibly helpful. And then to get a scorecard every couple of years. But so the big thing, you know, around, and I'm sure you know the answer to this, but, you know, what differentiates a B Corp versus, you know, an, like a traditional for-profit enterprise is that you, you set forth that the board of directors must take into account um, considerations beyond, you know, those relating to shareholders. So you broaden, you get into sort of a stakeholder theory type of approach where, you know, the companies, you, you have to take into account, you know, the impact of different, you know, past transactions on people, team members, uh, the community that you operate in, the environment, et cetera. Um, and, and I think we think that that's a really important lens because, you um, uh, you know, companies should be doing more than just focused on maximizing shareholder value. What are the key areas of impact that Encore is focused on? One of the really beautiful things about uh, being impact focused is that even if you don't care about the impact, in fact, it leads to better economic performance. Um, and there are a whole bunch of reasons why that's the case like external parties, customers, um, you know, no one looks at a B Corp in a negative way. And that might not be entirely true, but I think very few people think about B Corps in, in, in a negative way. And, and there are certain um, uh, uh, parties that definitely, you know, give, you know, give you preference. They want to work with B Corps, un, like unquestionably. And so it's helpful from a go-to-market perspective young, talented, talented people of any age, but in particular people earlier in their career, they want to work for impact companies. So I think we're able to recruit another B course, better people. And, and, uh, and then they want to stay, right? And it comes back to that retention issue. So like, I would highly encourage anyone that's running a company that is not an impact company to really think about it. Like I want to turn a little bit towards company formation and think about the way that we operate or build these companies is certainly the evolution of it. Uh, I'd like to know if we can talk about how to capitalize a development company, specifically 
how Encore has utilized different mechanisms over time. We've talked a bit about how you now characterize yourself as an IPP. Uh, I presume the structure of how you capitalize the business is different now. We didn't talk about the massive 150 million funding from SUSE that kind of got you there. Um, I'd love it if you would dive into capital formation, specifically with regards to development company. So back um, in Encore's um, early years, uh, we were a pure play developer. We would originate projects, we would find sites, we would create solutions um, with our um, you know, sort of trusted partners around offtake to meet their <clears throat> climate and energy objectives. Uh, we would then bring those projects through the entitlement process and we would sell those projects at NTP typically. So sort of a traditional develop sell model. The financing requirements associated with that pure play developer model are really geared towards funding two scopes of activities. One is corporate overhead uh, and then the other is development capital, right? To, the, to fund securement of sites, permitting, uh, you know, external third-party legal and engineering expenses, et cetera. In 2015, which was when I joined Encore, I think we probably raised $300,000. Um, the following year, and that was through a couple of, you know, small, really small financings. 2016, if I recall correctly, we raised $500,000 through a royalty note from an impact fund called the Flexible Capital Fund, um, we can talk about how that financing structure worked. <clears throat> 2017 or 2018, we ran, raised uh, a few million dollars uh, in a development capital uh, transaction from Leyline. Uh, in fact, we were their first um, first investment. Uh, wow, I didn't know that. Yeah. So, yeah. and this is development financing. This is debt. It was. Uh, it was a. It was a structured note. Yeah. Exactly. It was. Uh, it was um, it was debt. It was um, a hold co financing. It was providing restricted funds or capital that was whose use was restricted to certain activities for a portfolio of projects that we were developing. Eighteen, 18 I think we raised um, our second round from the flexible capital fund. That was uh, I think a million dollars. Uh, again, in, in the form of a, a royalty note, you know, which is sort of a mezzanine type financing. 2019, uh, and these are sort of rough amounts, um, yeah. just sort of going by recollection. Um, yeah. We ended up raising, I think about $10 million that year in the form of uh, a safe harbor loan, equipment loan from Green Greenbacker, yep. um, you know, for the purposes of safe, safe harboring uh, for ITC purposes, a, yep. a portfolio of projects. Um, and then sort of, let's see, 2020, 21, you know, um, you know, probably less, less interesting due to sort of what was happening around the pandemic, 2022, we raised $20 million in a, um, corporate loan from a group called Lacuna. And this was really phase one of a two-step process that, was oriented around capitalizing ourselves as an IPP. I'll come back to that in just a minute, but I think I think what's really important is that um, along the way, what we were seeking to do was to um, build our business into one that had all of the capabilities required to function effectively as an IPP. So we had this strategy in terms of what is it? What, what is the capability set? that we want in place when we go out to the capital markets to raise a hundred or $200 million of equity. And the story that we wanted to be able to tell was that it's sort of like just add water. So we have all the pieces in place. And what that meant was we needed to go from having origination and development capabilities to in-house uh, legal finance, engineering, procurement, construction management, and asset management. Those are the capabilities that you want to have to run a self-origination vertically integrated IPP, right? Those cov that covers the, the full gamut. And we, we felt that it was, it was going to be much more effective to go to the market and have a dialogue with sophisticated investors 
about a platform that was intact, that that didn't need to go out and hire a whole bunch of people, but rather, you know, was well well positioned to deploy this capital as soon as the capital was was funded in the company. So, you know, going back to 2022, um, we we needed some additional growth capital to get us to a point where and to complete the addition of some of those capabilities before we went out to the market for this equity raise. Um, and that's where this transaction with Lacuna came into place. <clears throat> um, that was set up as a three-year note, um, although our intent was to take that out sooner rather than later. So when we closed with Susie, um, a portion of, of the funds at closing retired the loan that we had taken from Lacuna. The balance was uh, came onto the balance sheet uh, in yeah, for the purpose of funding uh, working capital <clears throat> and development expenses. Uh, and then beyond that, the, the remainder of the $150 million will, will come into the company to fund predominantly CapEx. So as we take the projects that are in our pipeline that are working their way through to NTP, um, rather than in the past where we would sell those projects to another infrastructure, uh, an infrastructure fund, We'll keep those on balance sheet. We'll use the capital, the equity capital that has been committed and will be coming down into Encore as our sponsor equity, which we will then lever with tax equity and, and uh, project finance debt. Sponsor equity is a term that's um, used a lot in, uh, in this line of work. What does it mean? Uh, how can folks best understand sponsor equity? So if, if you think about... Um, the capital that's required to fund um, solar storage, uh, you know, other uh, clean energy infrastructure projects. Um, and I'm, I'll just focus on projects for the moment. Um, you can think about <clears throat> there being three primary uh, forms of capital. So um, sort of unique to this asset class or somewhat unique, unique to this asset class is you have this um, sliver of capital that is referred to as tax equity. And, and that capital is coming in um, for the purpose of accessing the ITC as well as other tax attributes associated with the project, primarily depreciation. Um, it's called equity because under um, IRS guidelines, it needs to take risk. De it needs to be deemed to take an adequate amount of risk to be perceived as um, uh, a, a, as an equity investor, but in reality, it is the um, it's the most senior investor in the capital stack. That's how these transactions right. get structured. You also have a, a slug of of debt on these projects, right? They're um, they provide really stable. Uh, operating cash flows over long periods of time that lends itself well to uh, the utiliz utilization of debt to capitalize the projects. And yet, you know, the two of those added together, um, you know, it'll be somewhat formulaic. It will depend on market conditions, but it, it almost invariably will leave, um, you know, some amount of capital remaining. And that has to come from, uh, that has to come from an equity investor the term that's used is, you know, is sponsor equity. And so what does that really mean? Um, you know, um, I mean, it typically comes from a financial sponsor, which is a term that's used in alternative asset management oftentimes, but it just means like real equity. So if the project doesn't work out, you know, who's going to suffer the most? Um, it's, you know, it's the equity provider or the sponsor equity provider. And presumably they're, they're in until the disposition of the asset. That's right. Went from roughly 300 in 2015, 2016 timeframe funding uh, to more than 20 million in capital in 2022. That's only seven years. I mean, thinking about the time spent by the CEO this time, Chad, um, with you as COO, CFO, all the sort of mini hats you were wearing, this becomes a full-time job at some point, just capitalizing the company. How much, so I have two questions. The first is, how much of your collective time does raising capital for the next round, the next year of life uh, occupy? You know, I don't know, um, 50 to 75%, probably at, at times more of my time would be spent, 
you know, working with, you know, running various uh, capital formation processes. Um, there's, they take a ton of time. And then, and then afterwards, they require, um, they, they require a lot of maintenance. Um, you know, there's governance and, and um, you know, there's, there's time spent servicing, you know, those, those financings. Governance specifically, like think about just if you were listening to the way he described the ley line capital, it specifically is carved out for very specific activities. So as a developer, if you're building multiple portfolios, if you decide to go in a slightly different direction, you can't take that capital along with you if it was carved out for specific types of projects, specific regions, who knows? Like there are many ways that the that this um, that it can be sliced and diced. So the other question I had was how far ahead did you begin to strategize as an executive team the roadmap or journey to IPP, like time period before it was actualized in 2023-ish time frame? I would say that we were talking about it, you know big picture periodically back in 2015, 2016. And, and part, partly because of, you know, the really radically different nature of um, the economics of being a developer versus an IPP. So, um, and, and, and then put within the context of what we at Encore were seeking to achieve. So as an impact company, um, we're seeking to, you know, build a platform that, you know, has impact um, and creates value, you know, for all of our stakeholders over a long period of time. And, and then if you look at the two, the, the cash flow profiles of to, those two different business models, you know, develop, sell is sort of like, soup, you know, actually it's like this, it's super variable, right? So you can do, have periods of time where you're doing really well. You can have other periods of time where projects get delayed, um, ITCs um, don't get extended, um, and and you don't have projects to sell, and you don't have a source of revenue. Um, so it's really, really variable. It's very hard to build a business like a you know a larger business with a long term vision with that with that financial model. On the other hand, if if you <clears throat> if you own assets, yeah, at least from the point in time at which those assets reach COD and start generating cash flow. You, you're owning a very stable, very predictable stream of cash flows, which is much better suited for what we were seeking to build as a company, right? So it was sort of this idea that, gosh, like, you know, this, there's this disconnect between our business model and, in fact, our objective. And, you know, if we could, if we could find a way to get from here to there, um, like that would be a much better match. And, um, but you're, you're, you're at this period where you're raising $300,000, like at a clip yeah. and, uh, you're just trying to like, you know, make it to the next step to the point where it's, you add one additional team member, right. To like add some capacity. It's also at, at that stage, it's like a chicken egg thing. Cause you need the project pipeline to justify the raise, but then you need a view to the capital to really commit to the pipeline. Right mm-hmm. at a certain mm-hmm. point. So 2016, 2017, 2018 is the the valley of despair uh, time frame. Like after a couple of uh, years of success that a lot of developers go through because they sell the project. They've been working so hard on that portfolio that if they were smart, they started standing up other originate like originating other portfolios. I talked to Aaron Halimi recently, um, and he was talking about how like it was so much more consequential the first ten projects as opposed to now where it's like a hundred projects you're working on at a time, you know, it's, you become essentially like a venture capitalist with your capital because you look at it and recognize like, okay, if one project dies and when you've got 10, 10 in in the hopper, it's super important that that doesn't happen. One project dies with a hundred in the pipeline or more. At what point was it clear that you had developed the kind of repeatable system that you could really go and capitalize? And I'm wondering, I'm wondering if in, like a relatively short period, like a couple of minutes, you could enunciate what those what those signs were or hallmarks. Like what as a, as an executive team, did you know that you had to look for those? Did they suddenly appear and you're like, okay, now we can take the next step? I'm thinking like, how did you how do you strategically or like navigate around this chicken egg scenario? You know, a couple of thoughts come into mind. One is um, coming back to, and I should frame this within you know 
my experience, which was like as a banker in the past, I spent a lot of time working with companies who would, you know, would be going to the capital markets to, you know, to raise, um, to sell equity, you know, in an IPO or another, out of the, uh, you know, or in, you know, another type of transaction. And um, like, there's always a story. So you're anticipating like how, what, what is like, how do investors think about value creation and what, what attributes, you know, are, are they going to be most interested in what things are they going to be most concerned about? And so we were thinking about this through that lens to some degree. And so there's, there, there are a couple of things. One is, is just capabilities. So like there, we, what we saw during this period of time or the last several years, as you know, there are a number of developers that raise capital, you know, and, and move down the IPP path. Some of them had the approach that we did. Others took an approach where they built a huge pipeline. They had really strong development business. And, and they said, if, you know, you know, if you fund it, like, we will build an IPP. It's like, right, if you build it. That's kind of like the Candela approach, right? I don't know their story so much, um, but very well. Is there one that you could point to that makes it, that like, so folks could understand, like get counterpoint? Uh, Sure. Um, So Blue Wave took this approach. um, Pivot took this approach. um, Okay. And and so like what they were able to do. And by the way, not like in, for, for the listener, like this is not a critique of no, different models. Right. It's just presenting counterpoints. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there are certainly things I think that, you know, we would look, look at that they did. And I don't have, I don't have inside detailed knowledge at this point to know how well it's worked or how, how well it's not. They've, both of those companies raised a lot of money from, you know, leading institutional investors <clears throat> and had built really big pipelines and high quality teams before going to market. So the difference not to pick either of them, but was, let's say, you know, we'll go to market with a big development pipeline. What we're going to focus on is just maximizing the pipeline um, that we have because investors assign value to that, as you said. Um, we'll go to the market. We'll tell a story about, you know, this incredible origination platform and mm-hmm. that, you know, we can put all of this onto our balance sheet if we raise this capital and then, um, and then we'll go out and hire, you know, an EPC and an asset management team. We'll build that additional capability. And that's a totally right. reasonable story. And, and it resonated. There were several companies, if not more, that did that successfully. Um, we took the approach that said, we're going to go with all these capabilities intact. Um, Mm. And so there's a trade-off. My guess is probably all things considered, if we had not done that, and rather we were adding all of those people, you know, instead of having 20 people on EPC and asset management, we had, you know, 20 additional developers and originators, we would have had a bigger pipeline, right? And so we went to the market with 200 megawatts, let's say, plus or minus, of DG pipeline. If it had, yep. you know, maybe we would have gone with 500. We thought the story we wanted to tell was sort of a de-risk story. Like we have the, we have the leadership in place. We have the teams in place. There's mm-hmm. no execution risk. So that's one layer. As we were saying, what Just, did it take to get there? The other layer yeah. was around the origination story. Now, f- like by story for us, it was like, Rather, what's like, what is our strategy, right? And story, thesis, it, yeah. it's not like story. I think this, the, the notion of a story, that's a, like a recipe for a failure. It has, if you're just telling a story during a capital raise, like, right, it's more like, how do you position, in fact, what you're doing strategically? Right. And so for us, a big yep. part of that was being able to say, and we talked about this the other day, was like, we go, like, we work with, partners. We, we, we yeah. went on ideas. It was that type of thing. And then repeatability. Yeah. So like, look yeah. at all these projects we did with GMP. We helped them create a G- green tariff program, like yeah. these projects with Middlebury. And they weren't like one single project, but rather yeah. a series of them. So yeah. those were like GMP two key Green tenets. Mountain Power for those unfamiliar in Vermont. Yeah. Um, you know, another thing that is, I wonder is, does it preserve equity for you all as shareholders? Like it's a long it's a long-term view. It's patient around the goals of the business. They're two, perhaps two different types of businesses. 
One is kind of a VC model, capitalize it early and grow as quickly as possible because there's only so much of the pie that can be eaten. That's like one way to think about it maybe. And that might be that I'm not saying that's potentially don't want to reflect again on pivot or blue wave or others. And in, mm-hmm. in that way, that's just kind of what occurs to me is like, you know, Facebook went that route. Facebook raised a shit ton of money. Like they're not alone. VCs in Silicon Valley sort of exist on that. I feel like a lot of developers who have come out of seasoned development shops and start um, now, the last two, three years, they do take that approach of like they take bigger swing. They take a, a swing at a, um, uh, earlier in the game at a home run based on the credibility and experience and folks betting on them being able to develop rather than the way Encore did coming out of um, three plus, five plus years of really proving that the model works. Carved out a niche, expanded around that niche, being brownfields into community or munis and working with the major utility. Does that resonate? Is that accurate? So from the time Chad started Encore, 2008 to 2013, we hadn't sold, sorry, 2008 to 2023, we had not sold any equity in the company. So. Mm -hmm. Our growth relative to a company that maybe uh, you know raised a large pool up front and was super mm-hmm. aggressive with respect to growth, um, you know, it was just a really different ownership profile. It was you know right. almost entirely you know employee owned at that point in time. Right. Um, you know, now we, you and I, um, I think talked about this a little bit, but you know, when we went out. For this capital raise, we evaluated a couple different, you know, structures. Um, yeah, and the structure that, that we dig into. chose there was, in fact, <clears throat> the one that was most dilutive to existing equity mm. owners. Um, so we sort of we went into that transaction from a place where we owned relative to a lot of other ways of getting there. You know, very large percentage. But then we, but then we entered into a transaction that resulted in more dilution than 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 the other primary um, alternative capital raising structures, and and I can talk about why we chose to do that if that's of interest. Blake, to round out this discussion on the capital stack, I feel like there's a conversation that you and I had that I want to make sure we do capture in a more complete format, and that is the different sources of capital, specifically why you chose the path you did, what are the different monetary structures and the objectives that they best meet? And once you've chosen that path, what happens to the money? You get 150 million in your checking account? (laughs) So just walk me through that, right? Let's uh, unpack those three for me. As you go to the market, um, Mm -hmm. so you're, you're going out to investors to talk about um, your your uh, your financing, your capital raising. <clears throat> One element of um, the discussion is going to be around structure. So, you know, you're seeking you're seeking this amount of capital um, for a given, you know, set of uses. Yeah. You know, based upon your strategy, your capabilities, your vision. Um, and then the question is, you know, in what form? What we initially did is we we went to the market and said we're open, we're flexible across three three different structures, and those tend to be um, the the structures upon which uh, most transactions take place when uh, companies are going to raise uh, equity like capital um, to to finance the development and then ongoing. Uh, permanent operations of solar and storage projects. So we had a strong preference, but we wanted to see what the market, you know, what the market looked like. What was the market complexion at that point in time? Because, you know, not only might your structural preferences play into the decision, but so too would market dynamics at any any given point point in time, right? In, in the mm-hmm. event that certain terms were particularly strong, maybe that would change uh, or at least influence your your decision making process. So, the three the three that we were looking at and that I referred to there were um, something called an asset co dev right. co, so mm-hmm. asset co development company. Um, then then something called a pref structure, pref referring to a preferred stock type of transaction. And then there's a parent co common equity structure. And so 
moving maybe um, coming back to the first one, Asset yeah. Co, Dev Co. Typically what that looks like is an investor will come in with two, uh, effectively a stapled financing. So they'll make an investment into DevCo. DevCo is the developer. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, development entity. And they'll yeah. come in and make a minority equity investment into the DevCo. They then will capitalize Asset Co., so a new holding company, um, into which all of the projects that DevCo, the developer, brings to NTP will, will, will be owned. So DevCo, which is now owned by the developer, plus this new investor, although the developer retains the controlling stake, they'll bring projects through to NTP, they then drop them down into ASICO. ASICO will be owned predominantly by a new investor, but the developer will have some residual equity participation in that asset co. By, by doing so, the developer will have some economics and a long-term cash flow generation yeah. of these assets that they develop. However, they will not be the asset owner Right, they'll they'll participate, but they won't be the asset owner. Um, so it's sort of like an IPP. It's IPP light. I yeah. would I would so you get say. a strip of the revenues, but you don't control you get a the strip asset. of the revenue, but you don't control the asset. Yeah. There's some there 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 are also some uh, conflicts of interest. So the new investor has a minority stake in Devco, but they yeah. have the majority stake in Assetco. So you know it's it's quite clear then that that's going to drive you know, the way they think about economics. So there isn't perfect alignment. There are other benefits, one of them being that the developer retains a majority stake in their company. That's a big benefit, right? And right. so there's, there's less dilution, but it doesn't meet that strategic objective. It didn't meet the strategic objective of ours, which was to become a vertically integrated <clears throat> IPP. So that was the least interesting for us. In this scenario, just structurally, is Encore Renewable Energy, the DevCo, or does Encore Renewable Energy create an LLC that is DevCo for the purpose of financing? Under that structure, if we had pursued that, the simplest path would have been for Encore Renewable Energy to be DevCo. You, you might end up moving things around and do it a little bit differently, but I think generally that would be the most Someone's likely Someone starting scenario. out, like they're not creating five, six, seven, ten 10 LLCs. Um, I mean, hold like there's a whole a whole other project finance of like how whole goes work, but yeah, my assumption here is that it coming in is that Encore Renewable Energy is the company that is the that is what <clears throat> as you said before you own if you chosen that strategy like you're only selling a mm -hmm. minority strip and yes. um, okay and then that's and, right. but you're bringing in a partner to fund essentially Asset Co. Asset yeah. Co. Right, right. The 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 entity that would own the right. projects that. Encore right. Renewable Energy yep. would develop. Effectively, right. what you're saying exactly. is, hey, uh, future Asset Co. Um, majority owner, we have a pipeline of origination that we think we can funnel into this pipeline of revenue, but we need someone to own that revenue long term and give us a developer fee effectively for developing it. And that's the development. And this is that's the DevCo Asset Co. model, right? So, for the sake of simplicity. Uh, yeah, the, the answer there is yes. Um, but maybe maybe I could move on to the the two other structures that I mentioned. So um, the preferred structure is one whereby uh, investor comes into the parent company. So we had talked about in the DevCo, ASICO structure, if Encore had pursued that path, Encore would have been DevCo. So if we pursued a PREF structure, preferred, uh, preferred um, equity structure, a new investor would have come into Encore, the parent company, with an investment into preferred equity. <clears throat> preferred equity sits within a capital structure um, behind debt, but above common equity. So it carries a coupon but it also participates in equity participation. So it's really sort of right between 
uh, uh, equity and debt. So the, 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 the pros and cons associated with that type of investment versus what we chose to do, which was <clears throat> a parent level equity investment, is that in a PREF structure, the investor participates to a lesser degree in the equity participation, the equity outcome mm -hmm. of the business. Um, so um, that's a good thing for existing owners, right? You, you minimize dilution. On the other hand, there's a pretty significant coupon, a pretty significant rate at which um, that investment accrues over time. And what ends up happening is that that coupon will serve effectively for developers as a hurdle. So let's yeah. just say that's an 8% coupon, for example. Well, if, <clears throat> if a developer in a given market can't originate mm -hmm. assets or acquire assets that exceed that 8% hurdle, they, they find themselves in a box. So mm. they won't pursue them. So their, their ability to grow and scale the business then ends up becoming curtailed right. by that. It's, an, it's effectively, it becomes an impediment. So there are pluses and minuses associated with the structure. What we didn't like about that structure was that, you know, based on the number of years we've been doing this, um, you know, lots of things happen, right? Supply, supply yeah. chains, supply chains stretch, um, you know, equipment pricing changes, uh, development cycles yeah. extend, interest rates change, and all those things impact returns. And what we wanted coming back again to this notion of we want to build, you know, a really highly respected um, value creating business for the long term. Well, what we what we didn't want to do was sort of be stuck in this place where we're our growth is constrained by this artificial number. Well, what you know, what yeah. preferred coupon did we lock into in this given financing? You end up uh, limiting your ability to create long term value because of short term trade offs. That's sort of how we saw it. Now, look, if you get it right, you give up less of the company, right? This is all just financial, like engineering and transactions, as opposed to what you're doing with the underlying business. But if you get it right, you give up less of the company yep. and you have a hurdle that you can exceed every time. But what we've awesome. seen in the past is that developers get stuck on that. Right. Um, and they have a hard time. Effectively, the market moves against them and they can't be competitive because they have a cost of capital that's too high. So we then looked and really focus by like from day one, our objective, we were going to evaluate how bids came in in those two categories, but our objective was um, to work with a sponsor or in this instance, when I'm referring to a financial sponsor, I'm referring to an alternative asset manager, manager of one form or another. Uh, our partner is a clean energy infrastructure fund. So mm -hmm. it's effectively a form of a private equity firm yeah, uh, private equity fund, but we wanted a group like that to come in with a common equity investment, whereby w we were all on the same page. We're all in the same boat. We have full alignment of interest. Like, there's no gamesmanship. Like, we all want the same outcome. Yeah, in terms everyone of how wins we the run same the way. Business. Yep, exactly. And and where there is no there is no coupon because we all just own a portion of the business on a go forward right. basis. We'll make decision like make decisions as a board and then an, as you know an <clears throat> investment committee as to what projects work, they don't work, where the returns, you know, meet our thresholds and objectives. Um, but we're all we're all in it together. And I should say that like when I when I say we all, like I mean all of us. So um you know, not not only, you know, sort of the senior executive team, but our entire team, and this is something we've had, you know, going back years, participate um, in the company's equity. And that's sort of, you know, <clears throat> a key part of, we think both culture, like, you know, culture that is so important to how we, we operate and effectively how, you know, how we all live for a good portion of the time, you know, we spend every day. Um, but also around performance, because we we want everyone to be thinking 
as if this is my company and it is their, like it's our company. And we think it's a really important mindset. And so too did uh, Susie. In fact, part of the transaction was one whereby, you know, there's a large incentive plan whereby as we hit, they're really simple milestones, but as we hit milestones over the coming years, those release additional units to, <clears throat> to the entire team. So as we perform the, you know, the, the ownership stakes that we all have today will become more valuable. And then in addition, we should, you know, we'll, we'll all get more. And that goes from like, where does that come you know, from? Employee comes one from, to employee, you know, every comes single from employee. The Susie shares, where does that redistribution come from? Yeah. So it comes out of the uh, total pool of outstanding units. Uh -huh. So there, you know, in terms of where does it come from, it, it sort of depends, uh, you know, on like, effectively it would come out of um, whoever's not getting them. So, um, so, so yeah, so, you know, it, it would come out of Susie's, um, uh, you know, effectively they would be diluted by the creation of those additional units because they would be going to employees as opposed to themselves, right? So the belief is if the team performs, we want them, you know, to participate um, to a larger degree and we'll get diluted, but that's okay because what we have is going to like, be more valuable um, by an amount that like capture, you know, offsets that delusion. Thank you so much for explaining all that there. I could, I think that we could give a symposium another two hours probably on just the, you know, it's, there's over 20 years of your personal experience of capital markets that goes into what you've been able to briefly explain here. Um, so I, I want to move into, to, I think you perfectly segue here into team dynamic corporate culture and the way that you and Shad are managing this company and not just you alone, but um, as the co-CEOs. Co um, you said earlier, if you're competing on ideas, you need to design your team differently and you want everyone to think this is my company. Can you elaborate on the corporate values that underlie uh, the way that you've structured the team and some of the interesting uh, differentiators and nuances to how your company is managed, maybe even um, the way that you see um, traditional gender norms being busted by Encore. This is something that we spend a lot of time thinking about. Um, and we've actually spent a lot of time thinking about, you know, what, what our values are um, as part of our strategic planning process. We use this, um, I'm, I'm sure you're really familiar with it, this EOS model, mm -hmm. um, which is, we've found over the last year or so since we rolled it out to be super helpful. But, um, you know, the, the values, um, I think we say, you know, so curiosity, integrity, determination, impact, uh, innovation. Well, we've got one other. Um, and all those things are true. Like, they're all true. I could go, like, talk about each one and give examples yeah. of them. So when we think about culture, um, I think like one of the simplest like kernels upon which everything else is built is that um, we're, we're looking to um, create not really good jobs, but we're, we're looking to create outstanding professional and personal growth opportunities and, and for our team members. And, and, um, I say personal because, um, we're, we're higher, we're, we're bringing onto the team, not, not employees, not professionals. We're hiring people. If you think about what, what motivates performance, what motivates people to stay and to contribute and higher and higher levels to support one another, mm -hmm. I think it's, it's being in a place, I know, and this is just based on my personal experience. It's, it's being in a place where um, uh, you're given an opportunity to consistently grow and stretch and, um, and learn um, personally and professionally and, mm -hmm. where, you're, and where you're supported. Um, and so then if you think about that, um, 
what does it take to do those things? So once you say, okay, we're, hi- we're going to hire great people who are also great professionals, we're, we're also going to try to create an environment where people um, are, are, are fully empowered and, and, and have a sense of autonomy and, and, and uh, the ability to lead and take on projects and, and to be the self-starters that we're hiring in the first place. Like one of the things that boggles my mind is when like companies hire these super smart people and then prescribe exactly what they're going to do. Right. right. Like, of course, mm-hmm. of course, they're not going to stay. Um, you know, we also we know that um, the, the research tells you diverse organizations perform better. Diverse yeah. organizations are also more interesting places to spend your personal time. Like we learn through not through people that are just like us, but through people who are different. And so, you know, as we think about. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, you know, our hiring criteria, we look and we say at every position, um, we want to hire the person that can optimize on course um, performance through the addition, you know, through the, the filling of this role. It doesn't mm-hmm. mean like who can do this job the best, rather yeah. it's their overall contribution makes the greatest impact to our success. And so therefore it's not only like, you know, a little box of skills, but rather it's how do they fit into the broader picture? And we include in our position description, something along the lines of, you know, we're not looking for people, you know, who fit our culture, but rather people who expand our culture. Mm -hmm. And so we went from, you know, a couple pre pandemic, when I joined, it was we were it was four white men, and yeah. today we're um, about forty team members. Roughly fifty percent of the team is uh, either female or gender non-binary. Large number of uh, team members, um, you know, fall into a, a number of um, diversity communities, whether it's religious, age, LGBTQ, um, gender identity, um, and um, <clears throat> you have to be intentional to get there. And the result is like, we've had some of the most I have, and I know others have like just amazing personal discussions around, um, you know, things like, I mean, I remember really vividly a conversation with two of our team members about, you know, in, in the LGBTQ community about, what did like, so what does pride month mean to you? Do you like, mm. is it a positive? Is it negative? Is it like pride washing? And, and of course, preface by if this is something you guys would like to talk about. Mm-hmm. And they came back a month or two later and said, Hey, could we talk about this at the monthly team meeting? Like this was so powerful mm-hmm. for us that someone was asking how we felt about these things. And, you know, the other cool thing about that is um, that it like it tells you where people are coming from and their level of um, psychological safety and where mm-hmm. like that they're willing to talk about these things, um, and that is something that like gives me a lot of uh, um, you know I just I just like really feel great right when people feel and you can see that they feel at work. Um, comfortable and empowered it's like it's awesome yeah can you can you t- uh, at the risk of not being able to talk about anything else in the interview because <laughs> uh, i don't want to um abuse your time any more than, than i have uh could we spend the bulk of the next five minutes at least um on that that notion of psychological safety uh how you view it now versus before um what you alluded to earlier as a mental health issue um mm-hmm maybe impact that as much as you want, like the inciting moment um, and what psychological safety in the workplace looks like to you now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the, the catalyst for us thinking about this at Encore and then I'll, and I'll go directly back to sort of my personal story um, was during the pandemic and, and, you know, observing, you know, how difficult it was for, you know, for our team members. And of course, you know, just so many people yeah. emotionally, um, psychologically dealing with all the various challenges, kids at home, trying to work from home. 
uh, not being able to leave the house. And so what we decided to do was <clears throat> have a mental health uh, chat, you know, team, team meeting. Uh, yeah. And what, what we did is um, uh, myself and Chad decided that we were going to, you know, kick it off with really open discussions about some of the challenges we've had personally over the course wow. of our life, not specific to COVID, but yeah. so as to create this environment where others, um, you know, felt comfortable talking about difficult issues, either like on, you know, during that meeting or in a follow-up conversation. I think that's been like really, um, you know, quite uh, impactful over time because it, it wasn't a one-off, but rather, you know, a series of conversations of this nature and, and, and where I've seen junior team members talk about, you know, their mental health challenges in an open setting, you know, and sometimes team members who had been at the company for just a couple of months. And, um, I won't go into the details there, but, mm -hmm. um, cause it wouldn't be appropriate, but like, that's when, you know, wow, this is actually, this is impacting people. This people feel comfortable. They feel safe. They know that no one's going to judge them. People know that like we're all people and no mm. one's, no one's perfect here. Everyone's, everyone's got their issues. Um, and so, um, yeah, for, so for me, <clears throat> and I, and, and I appreciate you giving me an opportunity to talk about this for a minute, because I think it's both important as it relates to what I just talked about, but also in terms of trying to share some of my challenges with, you know, others that maybe haven't gotten to a point where they're comfortable um, talking about them. Um, so yeah, if I, if I roll back the clock, I guess 15 years ago or so at this point, um, we talked a little bit about, you know, the, the fact that at least my career was, you know, going pretty well mm. at that time. Um, even though I didn't really, you know, find it all that fulfilling, but, um, so I, I ended up, um, suffering a, you know, very significant manic episode had not been di uh, diagnosed, um, with bi bipolar, uh, previously. And that, that, that episode was <clears throat> disruptive enough that it contributed partially to, um, you know, to, to me losing my job within a short period of time, I went from, um, having, um, you know, a few homes to, you know, literally within months living in my father's, um, third floor, um, you know, in one of the bedrooms on his third floor, uh, I had four kids at the time. Um, so you I, and your uh, family moving in with your parents or your father, my four, my kids were with, um, I went through a divorce. So, uh, my, wow. my children were living primarily with my ex-wife at the time. Um, I, uh, um, you know, as is often the case came off of that manic period and, and, uh, you know, went, went right into a, a period of, um, severe depression, uh, yeah. suicidal, uh, ideation yeah. for, for months. Um, and, and was in this place I had never been before, um, and I, and I don't want other people to, to be there like by themselves if they don't have to be of just like, right. um, exceptional loneliness, mm. um, and, and, and loneliness because you didn't, it's the exact opposite of sharing because you don't want to share. I didn't want to share because you feel, uh, broken and mm. like, you know, ashamed. That's like how, like, yeah. right. Like how, how our society it's getting better, but but treats people with, you know, mental health issues, challenges. And, um, like it took me years to get to a point where I would talk to anyone other than, you know, my closest friends, closest friends about it. Yeah. Um, and, um, you know, when, when I, when I, when I find, I finally got to this place where I said, um, you know, um, there are a lot of other people out there. And I realized it because I had mm. friends or, you know, guys that I went to college with who had heard, and then they, they, you know, reached out and said like, Hey, I'm struggling with this too. And, um, you know, that I wanted to try to, you know, 
talk about my challenges so that people don't feel like, you know, if you're out there and you're feeling this way, you don't need to. Like, every, like we can't compare, like, you know, our insides with other people's outsides, whatever that quote is, right? And it's so, so true. I want to reflect too on something you said to me um, privately when we first met. Uh, and I think that you were insinuating that it would have potentially short-circuited or shortcut your path to recovery. You said, if I'd known there were others like me who weren't failures. <laughs> uh-huh. Right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. What did you mean by that? And what were the implications? Well, um, I probably said like, weren't fuck ups. Cause that's how I felt. Um, you yeah. know, because you go from like, it doesn't matter where, where you were before, mm. but, um, like I mm. felt like pre previous to that point in time, like, you know, I was like somewhat capable and, and then felt just like totally broken. Um, yeah. and you, you don't know why, like, why me and how did this happen? And, um, uh, so what I meant by that is if, you know, like if I knew that, geez, like if I knew that this guy I went to college with, who is a CEO of this like incredibly successful company, who a couple of years later reached out to me, if I knew that like he had experienced the same thing, it, I think it would have changed, it would have changed my, like my thinking around, it would have given me, you know what, it would have, it would have shattered that sense of loneliness mm. and it would have it would have provided uh, a pathway like a, a vision that hey like this happens this happens and it's yeah you know it's not You're like not a one-way ticket right and and so right. it's going to be hard and the thing is is um like while it was the hardest thing that i've gone through um like I wouldn't change, like it was so disruptive, but I wouldn't undo it if I could, because it also made me just a way better person because I have so much more empathy for people who, you know, find themselves in these situations and, yeah. and, and, and who are in such a harder place yeah. than I was at the time. Because what I, I did have was I had, you know, I had, you know, a family that had a, had an extra bedroom. Um, mm. right. Like if that weren't yeah. the case, you think about like, why are people, why are so many people homeless aside from the fact that like our, our government, our society doesn't seem to care very much. Well, they have mental health challenges and they don't have, like, they don't have a support safety network. Net. You know, there's no safety net. Yeah. Um, mm. I, yeah, I have a ton of uh, empathy That's, for them. Yeah. Um, I, uh, thank you for sharing that. And on the on the final note that you said, the freedom, the psychological safety that it provides for people in your company, um, I hear you saying is is enough to justify your own so to sort of satisfy your own sense of completion that you went through it, that like you experienced it, and in many ways, yeah. so that you could empathize with others, but also so that you could provide that safety for others now, yeah. right? And and yeah. absent that experience you probably would not have been or it would have taken longer to become the kind of person who can provide mm -hmm. an economic and psychological safety net for the team that is serving the business that you've helped create. Um, I respect that. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's so interesting because I, I totally agree. And, um, you know, it never occurred occurred to me on this sort of journey of, you know, sharing more and becoming more vulnerable, which for the purpose of, you know, primarily trying to help others and along the way, realizing it helped me, right. It helps you. The more you talk about your challenges, like the, the easier it is, like that baggage just sort of drops away. But I never really thought um, until the last few years that in fact, it would be like a leadership attribute, like a value. And, and what we're seeing is, I think that there are multiple levels of sort of 
how you can lead through vulnerability. One is, and I think typically what's referred to is sort of like, you know, acknowledge that we're not perfect, that you made a mistake, that you could have handled a matter better or differently. And that's important. That's definitely important, right? Um, I think that I think that if you take it then to a sort of more personal level, it it change, it's another dimension in terms of how people I think one is like allowing people to feel I don't need to be perfect. That's important. The other is allowing people to feel like, wow, these are real people mm. and I can share whatever I want to share here. Right. And they're both important. Um, I don't think everyone does both. You don't have yeah. to, but it's worked really well for us, I think. As we wrap here, two things I think are important there. One, as an unintended consequence that becomes an intended consequence, it's a great retention model. And the second, which is even better, is you develop the kind of people who carry that skill set and that vulnerable leader trait into and thus seed other organizations with that kindness. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. yeah That's pretty cool. Yeah, it's cool. It's cool. It's been like, it's been one of the most interesting, rewarding parts of sort of the, the yeah. journey to date. Mm -hmm. Really, like, really rewarding. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what's rewarding about the unbelievable job I have is I get to hang out with people like you who are vulnerable and share at such a profound level, uh, not just how they are developing projects, but people and how we're developing companies, not just on the front lines of the clean energy revolution, but our cultural revolution, normalizing things like mental health issues and making it safe for people to bring, uh, to bring that to work and, um, and not feel uh, that they are less than because of mm. it, but that they're, that they're edified nonetheless. Cause, um, because we all have, uh, a bag of bones <laughs> and it yeah, takes, it takes true, some man. longer than others to, to lay it down. Yeah. Like I could, I could genuinely, I feel like I could spend a day with you. I'm sure that others who've listened this far feel the same. Um, they don't have the privilege that I do of being able to connect directly with you, but if they wanted to try and reach out and connect, where do you like to be found? Is LinkedIn the best way for folks to try to connect? Uh, you know, f people can feel free to uh, shoot me an email. Uh, yeah, you're a super so user of, 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 uh, super of superhuman. Superhuman. Yeah, shoot me a superhuman. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so it's Blake at Encore.eco. And, so, yeah. you know, on any topic, but uh, in particular, if anyone wanted to talk about yeah. like mental health issues, um, you know, I'd be delighted to do that. I love it. I feel like uh, we should we should host like a town hall for the Let's industry. Let's do it, man. Yeah, that'd be fun. We could do that. Uh, Seriously. We did that. We did that um, through the winter last year during the time of year where folks are um, less busy, like December, January, February. We hosted a series of town halls and just tried to get people together and talk about um, interesting topics. So uh, that's cool. I think, uh, yeah, yeah, I'd love to, I'd love to do that. I've got my own um, bag of bones I've been carrying that I don't think I've been particularly public about, to be honest, in um, as a. Uh, as an as an industry personality, so um, might be an interesting step for me to take. Blake, um, thank you so much. Uh, you've you've shared so deeply, and and honestly, um, you've I have learned in the in the last couple of hours that we've spent together um, in ways that I haven't learned since I was a project developer 2014, 2015, and I'm grateful for it. There were gaps in my understanding of how the business works that you helped to fill in. And um, so I just want to say, uh, I appreciate that. And, um, and I appreciate you. This, I think, as I told you offline, this interview, which happened over multiple days, uh, if you guys didn't figure that out, if you're watching YouTube, uh, I, tried to, uh, I tried to tie it all together. But uh, I think it is one of the, it's one of the, of the 600 plus, it's one of the better interviews. It's probably among the best interviews we've done on project development. And uh, I really do hope the folks reach out to you. I'm skipping a lot of the stuff that we do in kind of the traditional Suncast interview because we've spent a lot of time focused on how to help people level up, um, both at corporate level and at a project development company level. Um, so I just want to say thank cool. you once again, a non-traditional ending here, but uh, I look forward to the next one. And I wish you and the Encore Renewable Energy team 
all of the best. It's so exciting to see how you are um, you are really carving out a path that I think I think many others will follow. Yeah, cool. Thanks so much, Nico. This is awesome. I really enjoyed being with you for uh, you know a bit of time. <laughs> this is great. This is great. Really enjoyed it. I am so honored to have been able to have that conversation. I'm equally honored, perhaps more, that you are here at the end listening to the outro. Thank you so much. That tells me that this interview actually meant a lot to you. And as such, I'd like to ask you to please reach out, say thank you to Blake. Blake, man, it takes but it took a lot of uh, a lot of time for us to get through that, and it also takes a lot of courage to share in the way that you do and to build an organization with vulnerability at its core. Thank you. Also, that's the first time that we've been able to really share the inside look at what it takes to finance a project development company. I mean, this is Suncast Gold right here, folks. Believe me when I tell you that this is one of the better interviews you could have listened to in any podcast and one of the best on Suncast. And it gets to the heart of not only how to build a fantastic organization, but how to finance that company through to becoming an independent power provider, which is not something that just any project developer gets the privilege to evolve into. My hat's off to Chad and Blake, Chris, Lauren, the whole team. You guys are doing fantastic work at Encore. Thank you so much for all of your support always of Suncast and for insisting, especially you, Lauren, that Blake come on as a guest. What did you learn? What are you taking away from this? How is it going to help your organization role or career? Would you let us know if you're watching on YouTube, please just post us a comment. If you're listening on the podcast, I'd love it if you would just email me, nico at mysuncast.com or jump over to LinkedIn and give me a comment on the post for this episode. We sometimes are able to get it into the description, but if you haven't subscribed to our newsletter, that's another way to communicate back to us. You do so by going to mysuncast.com. There will be two or three pop-ups that prompt you to do that. That's also where you can listen to the entire back catalog of more than 650 episodes of Founders on the Front Lines of Clean Energy Transition, just like Blake. And that's where you can get the show notes, all the book recommendations, and all the research that I did getting ready for this episode, anything that Blake may have mentioned that I captured as uh, as a URL, a, a page that you need to check out. That's all over on the show notes. You should go, go check that out as well. Oh, and by the way, while you're at mysuncast.com, please go thank our sponsors by clicking on the links that show them that you have found them through Suncast. They help make this show free to you each and every week so that all you have to do is pay attention and give us some of your time. For that, I'm eternally grateful. And I want to remind you that you are what you listen to. Thanks again for showing up, Solo Warrior. It's half the battle.